The SNES had some great RPGs that still hold up today, but it also had quite a few that didn't get brought over to the West for various reasons. Over time, the likes of Final Fantasy V, Dragon Quest V, and Psycho Densetsu III would eventually be brought over, and now joining them is the cult classic Live Alive, finally getting a remake and being made available for English speakers outside of a fan translation. And yes, it's pronounced Live Alive, the katakana is on the original box. So let's take a look at what made this game so popular as to have a fan base despite never leaving Japan and why it's getting a remake. Live Alive has a unique game structure, which definitely helps it stand out. It consists of many small, individual stories following their own characters in different time periods, with differing gameplay as well. You'll pick one of seven scenarios in any order, go through a short story ranging from one to three hours, and gradually make your way through the cast until you complete them all, culminating in a grand finale. Going over the broad strokes of the shared gameplay, Live Alive is, of course, an RPG. You'll typically find yourself walking around, talking to various characters, and getting thrown into combat. Combat takes place on a 7x7 grid, where your characters take up one tile and your enemies potentially take up many. As you would expect, you can use various attacks to whittle down your enemy's health and win the battle. Here is where it gets interesting. Essentially, everything in combat costs time. Whether you move a character or perform an action, you are using up time that allows the enemy to do something. If you move or attack, then they may get the chance to attack you. You can plan how to use this time by passing turns to other characters, or by using certain moves that take time to charge. This is where you strategize. Do you use two weaker instant moves, or a stronger move that takes some time in which the enemy may move out of the way of? They might also be able to interrupt your action, resulting in you doing nothing. Do you move in close for short range attacks, or use your ranged options? Single target, or area? Maybe you should try your debuff moves to make them weaker, or your attacks to add damaging tiles to the field. There's no concept of MP or anything to limit what moves you can use. There's only time and strategy. Your health also refills at the end of every battle, which I like. Combat is overall good in Live Alive. My only real complaint is that some bosses and enemies have certain really strong attacks that you need to learn through trial and error. Stand directly diagonal with the wrong boss instead of horizontal, and you may just die. Your various moves can also go underexplained. You may be able to figure out what they do based on their description and experimentation, but even then it may not be obvious what stat it's actually getting power from, and what enemy stat is being used to defend. Of the power, IQ, vitality, and speed stats, your attack's damage could be derived from any of them, and the stat your opponent uses to defend could be any of them as well. You'll gradually find what attacks work best, but it would have been better if it were clearer. Presentation-wise, Live Alive looks really good for a SNES game. The out-of-combat sprites are good, and remind me a lot of how Final Fantasy V looked. The various time periods also allow for varied environments. But once you get in combat, that's when the game can show off some really good-looking sprites, especially some of the larger boss sprites. It really helps them come across as more menacing. The game also sports some good music. The composer here is Yoko Shimomura, best known for composing the music for the Kingdom Hearts franchise. Again, the very time periods allow for a variety of tracks, so the odds are good that there will be something you like. So now let's get into the different scenarios, what they're about, and the ways they differ from the base gameplay. They can be played in any order and are equally important, so going chronologically. The prehistory chapter follows the caveman Pogo and his gorilla friend as they encounter the female Belle, who fled from another tribe wanting to use her for nefarious purposes. This chapter is interesting in terms of story, as this is supposed to be in the time before language, thus there is no text, and everything is conveyed through expressions and pictures. This is a combat-focused chapter, with Pogo having the ability to sniff out encounters. The items enemies drop can also be given to a crafting vendor to make your equipment. Overall, this is a decent chapter, though there are times where the limited communication and makes exactly what you're supposed to do not clear. The Imperial China chapter follows a character known as the Master, Having spent his years perfecting his martial arts, he finds himself getting old and wanting to pass on his teachings. He finds three disciples, which you'll have the option of training. You'll go through several training courses, where the more you train a particular disciple, the more their stats increase and they level up, also learning the last move you used on them. You can split the training between them if you want, but you should really just pick your favorite and put all your time into training just them. Another good chapter. 
The Twilight of Edo Japan is probably the most impressive chapter in the game. There's just so much here. You play as the ninja Oboromaru as you infiltrate a castle, with the option of taking a violent or stealthy approach. Oboro has the option to hide, allowing you to avoid fights if you want, but you can also fight everyone you meet, with the game tracking each kill. The map in this chapter is huge, with many floors, routes to the castle, equipment to find, and optional encounters. I actually got a little lost at times. This chapter just has so much stuff in it, and it's a lot of fun. The Wild West chapter is simple, but sweet. You play as the Sundown Kid as you wander into a town beset by bandits. You'll find yourself running around the town finding miscellaneous items to use as traps for the town people to set, as the clock tolls towards the bandit's attack. There are only a handful of fights, but each one feels really dramatic given the setting. Sundown's also really fun to use in combat, given his ranged options. Not as elaborate as the others, but a good chapter. Now into the present day, you'll play as the fighter Masaru. With the goal of becoming the strongest in the world, you'll challenge fighters of various styles to rise to the top. This chapter is unique in that there's no leveling up, equipment, or even walking around. It takes the form of a boss rush, with each boss having their own array of special moves, which Masaru will learn if he's hit with them. While an interesting idea, I didn't like this chapter as much, given that some of the fights can be very annoying, especially when you don't know certain moves yet. The near future chapter follows Akira, a teenage boy with psychic powers, as he fights off an evil biker gang and deals with a government conspiracy, also giant robots. This chapter is very anime inspired, it even has an anime intro song. It does have some interesting aspects though, Akira has the power to read minds, which I'll need to do to progress the story. There's also an overworld map connecting the different areas, on which you'll encounter enemies which scale with your strength and level. Through these fights, you can also get robot parts and equipment, which you can modify into better gear for you or your robot turtle companion, who can actually use the weapon accessories as skills. With all that said though, this chapter has one or two points where you might not know what to do to progress. Just remember to talk to and read the mind of everyone. One of the weaker chapters in my opinion. And finally, we have the far future chapter. On the spaceship Kajito Ergo Sum, you'll place a spherical robot, Cube, as the crew escorts a dangerous creature and things start to go wrong. This chapter is unique in that it has basically no combat. There is a combat minigame, but outside of it, all you really do here is walk around the spaceship and talk. I find this chapter to be pretty hit or miss. While I like the story, this chapter was the worst for me when it came to not knowing where to go or who to talk to to progress. There will be times where you revisit every room to find what you missed. Despite that, I like how different this chapter is from the others. And really, that's the strength of Live Alive. While not the best RPG ever, Live Alive stands out for its uniqueness and willingness to experiment. It has a unique combat system, varied chapters in both settings and gameplay, and it all culminates in a satisfying ending once you go through all of them. While you may not like every chapter, it's pretty safe that you'll find something to like in this game. The same can be said of its varied cast and music. Its unique style also allows you to play it in short bits instead of having to commit to a long experience. There is a reason why it gained a cult status through its fan translation and why it's being remade with stunning new graphics. So if you want a classic, experimental RPG, go play Live Live. If you enjoyed the video, consider leaving a like or comment. If you want to hear about more underappreciated games, subscribe to my channel for more content.